Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Darren. I made my way to KL two days ago via the causeway and how apt you're talking at, uh, looking at culinary causeway. The causeway is one of the busiest border crossing in the world with 350 thousand travelers uh, moving up and down a day. And next year, we'll be celebrating its 100th anniversary. So I thought what it was like before the existence of the causeway, the goods that come from the peninsula, and we see the transformation of Singapore as, uh, into an uh, international port. So how do you go about doing this? You know, from the uh, from land's end, the end of the Eurasia, Eurasia landmass, to Pulau Ujung, that's the old name, Singapore. So it was via ferry. Let me just click this. Uh. So British Malaya, so played a big part in in, in shaping uh, where we are today. And I thought about my own crossing on that day, two days ago. Uh, I thought about the role of waterways, the role of... Let's look at this map. This map is from the 1700s. Water did not serve as a border, but water served as highways, served as uh, bridges, bridges of, bridges of culture, bridges of love. You could be in Java, but your mother-in-law is in Kotobaru. Yeah. And I, I thought about my, this crossing as I make my way to KL to talk about the food DNA in Singapore and Malaysia. And also I thought of another, another crossing centuries ago. The king of Singapore was uh, running away from the invasion of the Majapahit. How did the folks, the kings, uh, the royal family, down in the southern part of Singapore on Fort Canning Hill or Bukit Larangan, make his way up? Thanks to the rivers, that you know, this indigenous knowledge of using rivers, the rivers again, the, the other highways, from, from the river up, there's a little land bridge, connect to another river, cross the same causeway that I'm crossing, and make his way all the way up to Malacca to establish the Malaccan Sultanate, this family from Singapore. And then, you know, more, in more recent times, I thought about how Singapore, you know, was part of Malaysia, 1963 to 1965. Then I got to the other end of the causeway. I arrived at Stulang Laut. You know, for my, one of the things that I needed to do for my book was to capture, you know, look at you know, the indigenous folks. These are, they, they are one of these sea orang, uh, gypsies or sea nomads, depending how you, you look who's writing it. Orang Slita, as the name implies, they are from the Slita River. In the 1980s, they were offered either they moved to flats or go somewhere else. But thanks to the Johor State government said, you know what, you can come over here because they've always been plying, they've always been around the water, the Salat Tabrao, and the vicinity. So this was short very early in the morning. I, I wanted to interview and meet some of these Orang Laut. Yeah. And they, they are here, it's too, it's too long to, to bring their daily catch. To, to, by the way, Stulang Laut uh, has transformed. You, you're just condos and malls now. I mean, thank God that I did this like 14 years ago. So I arrived in KL. My aunt called me. She's just around the corner. She's at PJ section 15. She said, Kira, come over for dinner. I said, okay. It's my dad's sister. And she served me nasi lemak. Um, so yeah, dad, dad is from Singapore, sister in, K in PJ. 
uh, typically we don't, you know, the family and like many other family, nasi lemak is normally for daytime breakfast or lunch food, not dinner. But the grandkids wanted to have nasi lemak. So we would serve nasi lemak. Not, not this fancy one too. <laughs> so yes, there's so much, to, so much to reflect, so much to ponder about food and us within these two nation states today. Yeah, um, we're going to have a little quick discussion with Keir just to give some context into what he was speaking about today. Um, before we start, perhaps, Keir, maybe you could, um, you could enlighten us a little bit about your book and just tell us a little bit about why, what's in the book and why you wrote it. Well, I, I felt there was a need to document a topic that's under-researched, under-recognized, uh, you know, you look at, look at the, the Mirabeau's stall, the Nasi Lamar stall, look at the long line, the Luxor stall. But, you know, we have, we have done, we, there's no, a lot that needs to be done. We have not even reached the part where we need to codify our food. Um, so while the title is The Food of Singapore Malay, I happen to be a Singapore boy. But I'm using Singapore as a vantage point to look across, to look outwards, look across the region. What is the content of the book? Just to give people context. The content of the book, this book about food ethnology is how do you explain a people through food? Uh, it's about gastronomy, not just, not just what, why, you know, recipes, but there are few recipes, not too many. But to use geography, the context of geography and history to understand food, why do we eat what we eat? So it's a geographical, anthropological, social, somewhat political look on the evolution of uh, Malay food, but in the context of Singapore, simply because you're Singaporean. Is, would I be right in that? Yes, yes. I think all of the above you said, including political too, because you know, even remembering is political, right? So I wanted to do that. But we look at the subtitle of the book. It's called Gastronomic Travels Through the, Re through the Archipelago. Well, it's you know, Singapore as a vantage point, but really I'm addressing the region. Indeed, I think in these days when we talk about food culture, the, the trend is to move from really looking at nation-state understanding of food, but looking at trans-regional appreciation and understanding and look at commonalities, look at what shared heritage we have. Yeah, I think that's really pertinent because um, young countries like ours, uh, both Malaysia and Singapore, don't have, uh, I mean, what, what was prior to that is also kind of like excluded from our national sort of uh, conversation simply because you know, because it's, if you're trying to drive a certain nationalism, then there's like a certain narrative that you want to put. Did you find that your, that your wanderings throughout the Nusantara area, did you see a lot of commonality? Absolutely. So many of the foods that we, we claimed, you know, we, we enjoy and we, we want to make claims, they have been around before the existence of these modern-day states. And I'm pretty much, you know, if, you look, if you look at the larger picture, uh, we, we are aware of 1824 where the whole area, the whole archipelago has been carved out by colonial powers and then later on to the, the uh, you know, uh, with, with British Malaya. So yes, it, the food has been around for a long time. And indeed, when we look at the book, uh, it's pretty much a celebration, a tribute to the common ancestors. We are pretty much, you know, we are different branches of the same root. Right. So historically, just looking at, and just to, 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 um, to subdue my curiosity, historically, um, prior to 1824 or just around 1824, what were some of the common things that you would find? Not necessarily dishes, but what were some of the common things you would find over the Nusantara region? Brilliant question, Darren. Allow me to get the, 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 the clicker and then I'll show you some slides. So... Yes, documentation. I think it's important to look around. There was, there's something common. The, the idea of foraging, right? Before the existence of our market or even supermarkets later, we, we were going around looking for, we eat what is available around us. Whether, you know, we, you, you have a, a sort of a, 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 a seafront home or you go to the back of your Belukara, your secondary forest. I do a lot of foraging, uh, mostly around the supermarkets. I think, are you guys the same? <laughs> we have supermarket foragers. Yeah. Very oh, good at it. How times have changed, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, the next one. All right. Speaking of, so we saw that these saw the aunties working on to what they've just been foraged. And, and look at this. This is, this is the giant clams, right? So around our waters, 
So we get giant plants, what do you do? You preserve. Before the advent of refrigeration, there's something in common to that I, I observe. So we, we turn this into percussum, fermented giant clams. So just, as, uh, just to interject a little bit, could you tell us a little bit about percussum and, um, I, uh, and how it's prepared? So uh, do you preserve for the introduction of, you, know, you, you need the preservative. In this case, it's salt. But you preserve it in, in a, an aerobic setting whereby there's very little oxygen and that really triggers that fermentation process. And this is common throughout the Nusantara area or is it like very specific to um, a certain geographical location? I think there is something that, you know, the, uh, in many civilizations, not just, not just here, uh, we see that in Mediterranean as well. Right? The idea of you know you get you, you get fish in the salt and then you 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 keep, you keep for a long time and let it let it you know ferment. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. also also I think um, um, we would see common traits like um, the preservation of fish through rice or through salt with the Philippines, uh, also with uh, the Burmese and southern China. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so you so it's interesting to see that that despite these sort of like geopolitical lines, there there's a lot of um, commonality that's being shared either by culture or by science. Right. So it could happen through diffusion, you know, there's sort of monocentric beginning and then it spread, or it could also happen, you know, some multicenters, meaning it happened uh, independently. I, I want to show something. One of the things that I needed to do to put the book together is to look at text. And this is a kind of text that you see is shared between, you know, both sides of the causeway. Uh, look at the first one. This is Didi Khan. Ilmu uh, Didikan Ayam, done in, this is in Jawi. Um, I missed the dates though. Why WCA, cookery book? Very popular, so many editions of this. So many different iterations, the lovely sort of the uh, collection of the listing of the nomenclature of fish in our region. And then we have, this is from uh, Chara Barata Nat Kambing, looking at husbandry and uh, again, in our part of the world. Right. This is very familiar. Right? I was over at KLCC and somebody have this in a plastic bag. I almost jumped out of my skin because I love Hulu Um It has sacred origin um, and we use it for the Thanksgiving of a special occasion. But of course now it's commercialized. You can have it. You don't have to wait for somebody's birthday or somebody's wedding to enjoy it. You see this in Malaysia, in Singapore and in Indonesia. Something about rice about the color yellow, what it, what, it, what it symbolizes. Well, I think that's interesting because uh, a couple of years ago, we had a celebration and, and someone, you know, in, in very European fashion, normally someone would gift you a cake. Um, but I was at a, at a friend's restaurant and they, and they gave me this. I had no idea what to do with it. Like there were no candles to blow or anything like that. So it, it, felt, it felt very strange to me, but also at the same time, very like it felt very comfortable but could you tell us a little bit about you say that like the indonesians the chinese the, the malaysians as well as the singaporeans have this in common what does the color of yellow especially being from the kunyit what does that what does that sort of like signify well the color the color of i see the, first of all we take a look at the character of this glutinous rice it sticks well it's sticky rice Every grain is a unit. As you imagine, like every grain is you and me. Having this sticky rice on this occasion is about bringing it binds. There's something that binds that holds people together. It's about unity, about kind of kinship. So that's what that's that's, that's the role of the sticky rice. A little bit like uh, going through the MRT at five o'clock. Something like that. Yeah, you know, you yeah. you, you only have st everybody's st sticky st and stick, sticky. Everyone. Yeah. Um, I I want to share a little story. You know in there's a southern island. Within, Singapore itself is an island, but Singapore also has a collection of islands as well. There's an island called Kusu Island. That's where you find the shrine of the, uh, you find, you find a, a Malay shrine. At the same time, next to it is a Chinese temple that pays tribute to um, Tua Pek Kong. Uh, it's interesting that there's a yearly pilgrimage you go to visit Tua Pek Kong, but because of the fact that this topic Kong is this deity is in our region, and it because it's our region, it sort of it respects the re the regional sort of understanding of you know things you know spiritual. 
you cannot visit Tua Pek Kong, the Chinese Taoist temple, except with yellow sticky rice. Oh, is that so? Yes. Do you know why that is? I think Tua Pek Kong is the. Is if I'm, 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 I, I don't know, but just. Could you describe, this is a, a deity that exists only in the Malaysian and <laughs> Singaporean region. And he has like a songkok almost. Yes, that's the Datuk Kong. Yep. So th there's this understanding. You can imagine you, you come from Fuchen, you arrive here, you, give th you do your thanksgiving. But also there's understanding there must be a local deity that you, you, know, you, 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 uh, you respect. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. We have a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Um, so I just clipped it. Maybe yes, this will be helpful. This is interesting because what is in common? This is a stele taken from 7th century. Uh, you remember we talked about Malacca. Malacca has its roots in Singapore. And Singapore, they, the folks came from Palembang. And this was found in Palembang, this stele. And this translation goes like this. So the year 606, what, what stood up for me was this? Look at this. This um, this is actually a royal orchard. It talks about the four the four important crops: coconut palm, areca, sugar palm, and sago. And it's still, after all these years, these are really staples. These are things that have you know, a special place in our gastronomy. Yeah. Uh, before we end, I know we have. Her oh, I, you don't want to watch me making dodo, do you? No, I'm gonna skip. You know, this was this was taken ten years ago when I started the project because you really have to cook before you can write. We will skip that. It's very vigorous movement on your part. <laughs> more text, so more more literature here. There's a whole corpus of works that you know it is waiting to be discovered about our food. This let me just quickly. This is produced uh Singapore, Pulau Pinang. This is this is. 1938. Uh, this is Pulau Pinang, Kuala Lumpur, Batavia, Singapore. And what's really interesting is that is this Malay in uh, Arabic script? Or? It's Jawi, Malay in Arabic script. I, you know, while working on this, I found a colonial report, 1940. Uh, the title to returns you of is called Chemical Analysis, but basically is a study of all the food that was sold on the streets of Singapore. Um, and, and you know the street of Singapore in many ways mirrors the street of Pulau Pinang as well because Pinang was the first street settlement and Singapore was the third. So if we, they, were, they were interested in finding out what was sold, where, what ingredients went into it, the process, when it was sold, for how much, when it was consumed. So it's a great study and I thought it's interesting because we look at this, the listing on Misiam and Nasit Lama here. Yeah? This is a picture from Pulau Pinang. You can look at the phenotype. Uh, it has different names depending on which part, which region we're referring to for this dish. Uh, this came thanks to the thanks to the uh, uh, the Dutch and also the the folks in Sumatra who have this appreciation of making this in multiple layers that takes hours and hours. Very quickly, this is from the Gemras Journal of Royal Asiatic Society that talks about the Malay garden. I mean, it's not, I mean, today, of course, it doesn't apply to just Malay, right? You know, Malaysians, regardless of what ethnicity, you know, you have your own garden, you have your own pandan patch, or your, your uh, bubukantan just, patch at home. I know we're pressed for time, but I think we should all look at number one, number two, number three, number four. Mati laki, mati bini, which basically yes. means like dead guy, dead wife, right? <laughs> I'm going to skip that very quickly. Huh, this is a fantastic find. So, I, 19, 19, 19, 1914, Right. Only two issues is always issued during Christmas. Why? Because it's really a compendium. It's an, an, it's an anthology of literature work, po po poetry and so on, by British folks in British Malaya. I, I found this book and I got so excited when I saw there's one page entitled An Ode to Durian by the British. And, and I thought it's, it's necessary for me to take a look. You know how these days, you know, we, we love our cultivars, but I'm a big heirloom person. So I want to know what are the names of the various, you know, heirloom durian in our, in, in our midst. Yeah. Darren, I know we are, we are hard pressed for time. Very quickly before we end, I think we can, uh, we can help ourselves by reminding that, you know, we have been kind of looking inwards 
right? We forgot that we are maritime people. We forgot to look outwards, to look at the sea, to look at the straits, the, as, as highways, as bridges of you know, culture and love, a relationship, a family. Because if you were to do the latter, then we can understand why we have all this shared gastronomic heritage. And I think it's yeah. really pertinent to look at gastronomy as, and if I understand what you're trying to say right, and we had a discussion about this just now, about how there are so many of these complexities and nuances that look like knots and they look like hindrances. But if we step ourselves backwards and look at the entire anthropological um, environment of where we came from and where we're going to, we'll see that a lot of these discussions about what divides us are are not as significant as a discussion of what as what a discussion of what binds us are and looking at what you've presented today and what you're showing us there is so much that we share in common compared to what we don't share in common absolutely i think what needs entangling is this whole you know we start with this idea of otherness what you know this convoluted you know, look view of food uh, which is rather skewed. But I think what we don't want to entangle is we don't want to entangle this beautiful tapestry, right? You know, tapestry made of knots. You know, that's what it is. So we look at ourselves as, as a people in the region that have so much in, that we share. So we don't need to entangle the tapestry because you want to keep that picture. Thank you very much. Kerry, uh, this has been wonderful. Um, we really appreciate all of this feedback. Uh, if you've not read the book, it's this thick. Uh, you should definitely go and look for it. It's a great resource and a great compendium. Um, and I guess in conclusion, what we have to say, and I guess I'll, I'll say this out loud, is that Singapore chicken rice really is a lot better than Malaysian chicken rice. You can crucify me later. Thank you very much, Kara. A round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.